Now, I'm a neurologist by trade, but uh, certainly in this hospital and increasingly neurologists take part in stroke. Not so much during hours, but more so to fill numbers sort of out of hours. So I won't talk about stroke at all. My brief was really to give you an idea about what we do in neurology. Um, Amrit's brief is more um, how to get their career changes or pathway changes, training changes. So I won't touch too much on that. And we've got a few, uh, a few little case vignettes, and um, I won't go into any detail, but uh, I will ask you whether anybody has any idea about the diagnosis. And if you get it right, you get one of those, all right? Good. So, um, so uh, neurologists have changed working in the last sort of 10 years, certainly in hospitals like ours, where there's a lot of acute neurology not sort of these academic ivory towers that still exist and that still house them with very, very peculiar syndromes and otherwise do research and not much else. And I'm not sort of that type of person, never was. And increasingly, I think neurologists realize that there is more than just very, very rare syndromes, but also acute neurology. We come to that um, in a moment. I chair the acute group of the Association of British Neurologists to try and improve acute service provision across the UK because it's still quite shocking how few smaller hospitals get any neurologist who might visit patients who are there with a suspected Guillain-Barre syndrome or with a myopathy or uh, things like that. So a standard week might be that um, the team does a big MDT in the morning, then there might be some admin time, there may be a weekly academic meeting, case presentations, guest speakers and things like that. Um, equally, consultants need to talk business, how to run the service. There may then be, in that case for me, I do an, a telephone follow-up clinic for epilepsy patients um, once a week because many don't need a face-to-face -face interim consultation, perhaps only sort of six months or uh, uh, every year, but need checkup on their medication changes. Juice, this is my busy day, my long day, so it starts with radiology, MDT, do a ward round, see people on the day case unit, have a big clinic and get home perhaps by seven or half seven or thereabouts. Wednesday is my rehab day. I go to St. Cross Hospital, do a little clinic, do a ward referral session and then finish early. So it's very nice. That bit might be in Warwick, that might be in Nuneaton. So most uh, centres work as hub and spoke. So Wallscape would be the hub and the spokes might be things like hospitals like Redditch, uh, uh, Kettering, um, Warwick or Nuneaton. Thursday is a day with lots of admin uh, responsibility, teaching trainees. Most of us in the department supervise one higher trainee or one general trainee and manage their uh, e-portfolio for their um, education or CPD audits and other uh, educational responsibilities, supervising epilepsy nurse or uh, neurology nurses. And then Friday, for example, is my big epilepsy clinic and then a ward run in the afternoon. So that is sort of a, a standard week. but. When we are consultant of the week, starting Friday 5 and finishing the following Friday 5, certainly during daytime, we are the on-call consultant together with the registrar throughout that week, which means we are responsible for running and being responsible for the emergency admissions, for ward referrals, but also for GP or other uh, 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 health professionals asking advice about existing patients or new patients. And we really spend a lot of time on the ward in the mornings with a daily sort of MDT or board round, then seeing ward referrals, uh, new admissions on the ward. There's a lot of vetting work to do because we get hundreds of referrals to neurology from primary care every week, and they need vetting for their appropriateness in which clinic they go. Now that takes up lots of time. We do a daily clinic where we see people with blackouts, possibly first fits or syncopes and acute neurological cases, i.e. patients that we feel need to be seen more urgently. Then we again go to the ward in the afternoons and see more ward referrals. So this is a, a, a busy week, but I think it's a quite rewarding week because acute neurology done by neurologists is 10 times more effective than acute neurology done by non-neurologists who take a long time to diagnose a case, do a lot of tests that might not be needed to still not get to a diagnosis, and then delay matters. We are on course with one in seven weekends, one in seven evenings, and one in seven we do one of those weeks covering neurology and stroke out of hours. 
So, um, what might a typical outpatient in general neurology be? Because general neurology is still the sort of uh, 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 um, one of the mill uh, work we have to do because there's such a huge demand. Headaches, numbness, tingling, dizziness, imbalance, vertigo, blackouts, fits, tremor, shaking, jerks, weakness, pain, memory. So a whole range of complaints patients might come with. Of course, you know, these are not necessarily diagnosed. These are sort of just symptoms patients might be referred with. So what are common clinic scenarios once you've perhaps uh, uh, thought of a symptom and come to diagnose these? Patients who come with headaches might be diagnosed with a chronic daily headache, which you might be more familiar with as tension type headache. They might have migraine or other migraine syndromes. They might have analgesic overuse headache. If they come in with numbness, tingling, they might turn out to have something like carpal tunnel syndrome, they might have a neuropathy, they might have, you know, they might turn out to have MS. You just don't know when the patient, before the patient comes in, or they might have nothing wrong, <coughs> wrong with them and might just sort of uh, healthy warriors who tingle and feel numb from time to time because they're anxious, stressed, and perhaps even hypochondriacs. <laughs> tremor might be harmless essential tremor, it might be funny dystonia, might be Parkinson's disease, might be medication. So a lot of possibilities. People come with gait difficulties, limping, staggering, you name it. They might have disease of the spinal cord. They might have vascular disease in the brain. They might have Parkinson's disease, which nobody has noticed before. They just might have arthritis. Or they might just be worried about falling because they fell once and now they walk as if they might fall any time again. I think there's something the geriatricians call the three Fs, fear of further falls, you know, quite common. Um, people might have a blackout or a convulsion that might be a syncope, might be a simple faint, might be a seizure, or if it's recurrent epilepsy, maybe psychogenic non-epileptic attacks. You need to have a little bit of an understanding of psychiatry. Dizziness vertigo might be a labyrinthine disease, which really... Uh, 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 GPs or ENT surgeons should be diagnosing. It might be vascular disease, it might be migraine, it might be something like MS, or it might be nothing at all. Forgetfulness, poor memory, might go to memory clinics, might come to neurologists, might turn out to be a terrible dementia, but more often, again, it's concentration attention issues because of poor sleep, stress, worry, anxiety. So one has to have a very, very broad outlook on what goes on in the human condition. Common on-call scenarios, you know, acute onset headache is one of the most common emergencies uh, presenting to ED. And it may be nothing. It may be something like a subarachnoid hemorrhage, I mean, not the tests. It may be a bad migraine, maybe meningitis, meningoencephalitis. If you have sort of a localized weakness, one arm, one leg, that might be subacute uh, all sudden in onset, you know, it might be a stroke, maybe a new presentation of MS, maybe MS relapse in a known MS sufferer. Loss of consciousness, we talked about that before. A very, very common acute referral to casualty, maybe a seizure, maybe a syncope, maybe something else. And then, you know, people presenting with altered mental state at any age, and the differential diagnosis is enormously wide from infection triggered delirium in an elderly person, to serious herpesimplex encephalitis, or to plain psychiatric disorder presenting in this sort of particular fashion. So, um, a few cases and sort of perhaps some gummy bears. The 36-year-old male, 12 months frontal headaches, they are pressure-like, they are present most days for a few hours. Patient might wake early in the mornings, with headaches, but you know, there are no red flag symptoms such as posture change, vomiting on waking, things like that. A few times a month, headaches are much more severe. They are throbbing, feel sick, goes to bed for a few hours because he can't stand carrying on with his daily activities, takes bucket loads of cocodamol, neurofen, probably three times a day and has been doing so for the last year. Um, he's got a new job, works pretty long hours. And as a teenager, he may have sort of had a few migraines. So rather than dissecting the case in detail, just one of you shout out the two or three things that are going on. One, two. Yeah, three. Migraine. Migraine. Here you go. It's easy. It's easy. 
numbness tingling, so 27 year old female, but could be male, you know. Three months numb feeling in her legs, possibly also in her arms, um, and uh, in the right face. It comes and goes, it usually lasts minutes. Vision may be a bit blurred, there are no sphincter symptoms, never happened previously. No other past history or drug history. A cousin was recently diagnosed with um, MS. Examination is absolutely normal. What's the likelihood of this being MS? Quite low. Because, you know, who said that? Well, uh, sorry, almost. Um, no, it's quite low. Um, most patients who present with MS really have more to go for them than just sort of fleeting sensory symptoms for a period of time without really any of these other pointers, urinary urgency, frequency, perhaps a past history of an optic neuritis many years ago. And clearly, I think there'd be a lot of anxiety, isn't it, about this. And numbness tingling is the par excellence together with dizziness of anxiety symptoms. So we see a lot of that in our patients. So dizziness imbalance, a very common referral reason. So an 82-year-old man, last 18 months, increasing difficulties walking. He feels as if he sort of suddenly goes off balance as he falls. There's no vertigo. He had a few falls, in fact, and a few near falls. There's no loss of sensation, no loss of feeling. There's no weakness as such in his limbs or arms. He gets up at night to visit the toilet. He's got a big prostate. Um, some decline in memory function, but sort of all in all, he functions all right at home. He's diabetic, hypertensive, had a TIA before. And again, examining him, there isn't a great deal to find. Sort of he wobbles a little bit when he gets up too quickly and walks sort of cautiously because he's worried he might fall. But there are really no hard neurological signs on examination. It's something that people just don't get in primary care or in hospital. But it's very, very, very common. But it's nothing serious. So any idea? Anybody? So if I did a CT scan on this man, and I might, because he sometimes miss sort of rare things, you would get a little bit of vascular changes in the head. But nothing else. You whisper something. <laughs> well, then you, go, then you won't get the hurry bird. So you've got one already, so you've got no right for another one, really. <laughs> You're on the right track. Okay, I have another one. So essentially, I don't think he's got dementia, but he's got essentially cerebrovascular disease. And if you have cerebrovascular disease, all these things that are relevant to maintain your equilibrium, your balance, just don't work as well anymore as they did when you were fit and fighting and 20, because you've got vascular changes in the pyramidal tracts, vascular changes in the, probably in the labyrinth, uh, in the brainstem, in the cerebellum, and your balance or perception of balance and centeredness just won't be as good anymore. I call it cerebrovascular disequilibrium, you know, and that's very, very common. And um, Amrit might uh, 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 agree, lots of re patients referred like that, very elderly with this story. And in primary care, it's just people, you know, just don't seem to be understanding that that is common. Lady, um, as a teenager, she had sort of lots of jerks in the morning, sort of sometimes flinging across her coffee across the table. Um, she had a few big blackouts with shaking where she bites the side of her tongue and is incontinent over the last two years, so it sounds like seizures. She's seen somebody as a teenager, doctor, years ago, the medicines that were prescribed, she didn't like, didn't want to take, had other interests those days, perhaps boys, I don't know. Brother has fits and takes medication, but it's reasonably well controlled. So examination normal, ECG normal. If you were to do a brain MRI, would also be normal. EEG may be normal first time round, but maybe 
abnormal uh, uh, if you do it often enough. So what's that likely to be? Any idea? Is epilepsy? Would you hazard a guess as to what sort of epilepsy? Have you heard of common epilepsy syndromes that affect teenagers, where they have jerks and... No, that's pediatric. They get different type of attacks. No? Juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, JME. It's the most common epilepsy syndrome in adolescents and probably throughout sort of the epilepsy nomenclature and it's relatively easy to diagnose in most people easy to treat but in some people really 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 difficult to treat either I keep them or I give them to you I do. <laughs> you have them. <laughs> um, tremor shaking jerks so 68 year old woman four months of shaking in her left hand is mostly addressed or when she sort of walks it's worse when she's upset no weakness in that arm or elsewhere, no loss of feeling or sensation. Perhaps a bit slower when she's been walking and in her ADLs, according to her husband and daughter. Vision is all right, so no double vision, loss of vision. Speech is all right, so no dysarthria. Swallows are right, sphincters are right. Um, so ignore the bottom bit for a moment. So what does that story sound like? Mm, ignore the bottom bit, just look at the top bit. So unilateral, mostly a rest tremor or tremor when the patient sort of walks, doesn't swing her arm very much. That is Parkinson's disease. Now, I don't know who said that first. Huh? <laughs> okay, we keep that for the next one. Oh, no, you can give it to the other guy. Okay. To the other guy? Oh, no. <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't negotiate. <laughs> so now you come in but too late now, because it was the wrong answer at the wrong time, wasn't it? What is a shaking is bilateral, and it's mostly when people do things, hold things over bilateral, postural or kinetic tremor without the other bits. That's benign essential tremor, yeah? any ages. I might have one more case, but we have one, one more. Ah, good, that's my last, last bit of um, Harry Bowes. So 65-year-old man, increasing difficulties climbing stairs, uh, sort of aching in his muscles, especially when he does uh, uh, climb stairs over the last 12 months or so. There's no foot drop. He's got some difficulties reaching out sort of to high covers, especially if he lifts heavy objects up there. Perhaps once or twice, many years ago, when he was younger, he thought he sort of peed rather black Coca-Cola colored um, wee after sort of a, a hike on a hot day in the Lake District and felt pretty rotten but thought, well, it's just the heat and didn't seek any medical attention. Otherwise, he's well, doesn't take any medicines prescribed or non-prescribed. And all he vaguely, of course, as a paternal cousin, apparently had some issues with his muscles. So if you were to examine him, you might find very little. You might find a little bit of proximal muscle weakness, but you might not. So any idea? So what neurological bit, well, or what anatomical structure in the body doesn't seem to work well in him? The muscles, isn't it? All right, not the brain, it's the muscles. What can happen to muscles? Dystrophy, does dystrophy hurt? Especially after exercise? No, not really. What else can be wrong with the muscles? Inflammation. Inflammation that can hurt. Good. Um, bit ought to have a family history and have this funny story, isn't it, uh, with exercise and then. So this chap probably has a metabolic muscle disorder. Might be something like McArdle's disease or Pomper disease, which can present in older people. And is something wrong with glycogenolysis or other pathways in the body and they typically get sort of exercise induced myalgia and can get rhabdomyolysis that makes you pee um, coca-cola urine if it's sort of textbook but well, i keep that um pain oh i've got more pain okay 36 so last chance i think um lady last three to four years increasing pain aching 
in the neck, shoulders, arms, a bit of tingling and shooting pain down the left more than right arm, can't do her housework, says she can't really look after her children anymore, occasionally low back pain as well, she feels fed up, she says nobody helps the bloody NHS, doesn't help me, nobody wants to know about me. She had the scan of her MRI spine by the GP of the neck, bit of wear and tear, blood tests are normal and if you examine her, apart from a lot of pain when you even look at her, uh, far from touching her, there isn't really much to find. Well, maybe fibromyalgia or may just be, you know, um, uh, the commonest reason why Westerners are not working, sort of cervical or lumbar spine pain syndrome. So it's musculoskeletal little pain, very, very little pathology, but a failure, I think, of an individual coping with very minor health issues and that lead to a total collapse of sort of... Um, uh, the world around them. And this is really happening a lot. And these people come to rheumatology clinics, pain clinics, neurosurgery clinics, neurology clinics, and are really quite difficult to manage because they are in many ways incapacitated, you know, but um, it's very, very difficult to do much. And increasingly sort of uh, health systems try to develop these sort of um, musculoskeletal sort of pain clinic services being funded to provide physiotherapy, occupational therapy, psychology and pain services. Anyway, who said fibromyalgia? I think you did. So at least sort of, okay. Right, so, oh, but one more, memory difficulty, because I thought I'd give you a little vignette for all those sort of um, uh, 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 bits we might see. A 55 year old man, last nine months, more and more difficulties remembering names, also failing to complete sort of usual tasks at home. Family is concerned about some self-neglect, some out-of-character behavior. So he might just, in a crowded room, go to the corner, drop his pants and be in the corner, for example. You know, it's not a very normal behavior for somebody uh, like him or anybody. So no other focal neurological symptoms. So arms, legs, vision, speech. No relevant past medical, family or drug history. And the usual bloods GPs often do, biochemical, B12, folate, TSH, add a VDRL if you want, all normal. So some idea what this might be. Sorry, I haven't got any more. That sort of thing, isn't it? Most likely, isn't it? Memory issues combined with frontal lobe disinhibition, isn't it? So all I wanted to sort of really show you is, you know, it's a really broad sweep of all sorts of things. So I think, in a way, neurology, I think, is the broadest of all specialties because it's a microcosm of anatomy because, you know, not only is the symptomatology very varied, the pathology is very varied, pathophysiology, it's really head-to-toe medicine. And for those who are really keen on new things, they're really newly emerging areas of diseases. This is I didn't know of when I trained. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't really know much about these autoimmune encephalopathies, which we now treat with IVIG or rituximab and things like that. In another 10, 15 years, we might treat dementias with monoclonal antibodies when there are lots of things happening. There's varied clinical practice. You might work in a neuroscience center. You might go out to a DGH doing ward referrals. You might do some very, very specialized clinics. I mean, colleagues of mine, they might do um, a Tourette's syndrome clinic once a month or so, you know, and nothing else apart from um, some other bits uh, uh, of neurology. Uh, general neurology outpatients, there's acute neurology looking after these sort of cases I told you about earlier. There are complex inpatients, not only neurologically complex, but there might be psychosocially complex and also complex in terms of what you actually do, where do you get them given their uh, significant disability or behavior issues. There's an appreciation of diagnostics because one has to accept that things are very, very gray. So if you're somebody who can only live with black and white, don't do neurology, you will be very frustrated very quickly. It's often a shade of gray. There are academic opportunities. I think they are getting somewhat less simply because academia is running out of money and there are bodies needed on the ground to see all those patients. And I think you're also likely to work with very interesting colleagues. So it's a microcosm of medicine from scalp to souls, literally. Um, any anatomic part of the body can really be affected by neurological disease, almost any system in the body. 
you need to know your general medicine. So I think one, I think there's one positive aspect to the changes in training that you have a little more idea about general medicine nowadays before you become a neurologist. And understanding a bit of neurosurgery is good and stroke as well. And um, you need to understand and accept the importance of psychiatry and psychology. So you're a detective in one way. Um, you know, rare stuff, channelopathies, autoimmune things, prion disorders, metabolic disorder of a childhood that present in adult life. But you also have to be a counselor, you know. Uh, uh, the patient who thinks they have a dementia, lose their memory. No, they're just stressed and can't concentrate because they don't sleep well and so forth. Or you need to counsel people about medication overuse headache. Or you need to sit down with a young person who just started a family that they've got new MS, which is quite bad in what it means. Or you might have to discuss end-of-life options with a patient with motor neuron disease, where you know the question is, should one put in a peg or should one uh, 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 use non-inventive ventilation? So these are all the things you have to do as a neurologist, and these are the, the areas of spe uh, specialties you have to. Uh, 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 work with collaboratively neurosurgery, stroke medicine, neurophysiology, which is a career option if you want to do neurosciences. Neuroradiology is a career option if you want neurosciences, and neuropsychology, neuropsychiatry. So, and your word counts. I think neurologists are still quite respected. When they often, if you see a patient as a ward referral, you might be the last person who's been asked to see a patient. They've seen all sorts of people, and nobody knows what's going on. So let's ask the neurologist. And sometimes we might just be able to say, actually, you know, if we can't come with a diagnosis, just stop here. You know, it's pointless. Don't go any further. Just be pragmatic. Your professional views often count. And we are often sort of the arbiter, I think, very much in very complex cases. For example, on intensive care. Find the word. Okay, I still enjoy it. Services really need a lot of improvement uh, in the future. There's lots of trivia, but even those patients who can help enormously, there's extremely rare stuff that challenges you and you might not get the answer. And don't forget stroke, and Bandler would be pleased if he was still here that I say that, because it's an increasing part of neurological practice and neurological rotors. Okay, that's it.